Hello friends, welcome back. Uh, we are going to start our first talk about Come Closer by Sarah Graham. Um, you know by the end of chapter one already that something is a little bit off with this character, Amanda, uh, and the world that she lives in. Um, by the end of the first chapter, it's established that Amanda is an architect and she is working on a new proposal for a project at work. And when she puts this proposal on the desk of her boss, he looks down and sees something terrible written across it that I, I won't repeat here, it's in your book. Um, but it is a terrible, hateful, hurtful, homophobic slur written about her boss. Um, of course, she denies having done this. She has no idea how that happened. Uh, and we have no reason to, to not believe her. Um, why would she do that? She doesn't gain anything from that. Um, however, if we look a little bit closer, um, there are some things that we really can't deny here. Number one, we know that the proposal came from her computer. There's, there's no denying that. Um, it's a proposal that she wrote. Um, she could have gone back and deleted the part of the proposal that was really mean and then gave the fresh one back to her boss. Um, so there's a lot that shows there that she's in complete control. Um, in addition to that, the fact that she confesses to us, the reader, um, that she feels that way about her boss. That, you know, I didn't write that terrible thing, but I think that about him. So we could say that she is projecting those feelings onto her boss, maybe without realizing it. So already, just by the end of chapter one, we're starting to see those multiple layers of psychological criticism um, happening here in this novel. As always, anytime we begin a new story, I like to kind of situate us um, in, into the middle of it. I like to look at where we are and who these people are. Uh, so let's first take a look at our setting. Where are we? Uh, well, to begin with, every haunted house story needs, of course, a haunted place. It needs a bad place. The bad place in this story is this 100-year-old building where Amanda and Ed have decided to move in together uh, and remodel an apartment. So this 100-year-old building, it's far from the city, it's lonely, and it's often very cold there in the neighborhood. Um, there's no grocery stores or restaurants around, so there isn't an active social scene happening around uh, Amanda and Ed, who are both younger. Uh, there's no crime. In fact, the only thing that makes Amanda really nervous are the packs of wild dogs that roam the empty streets at night. Um, the apartment building itself is only half filled, so there are not a lot of other neighbors immediately around them, which means the place must be fairly quiet and kind of feel very empty and lonely. And Amanda and Ed got their apartment at a great price, which left room for them to do some renovations and to sort of personalize their home uh, to their taste. Uh, the age of the apartment building, being 100 years old, suggests that it's seen a lot of residents come and go in its history. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of life has come and gone in and out of its front doors. It seems like the right environment for a few ghosts to kind of be knocking around. And the couple, in fact, hears knocking on the walls, always in sets of two or four. So there's this really strange pattern to this little knocking on the walls. Um, and what's really unusual about this is it only seems to happen when Amanda is around. Uh, when uh, Amanda leaves for a trip out of town, Ed tells her that the apartment was completely quiet the whole time she was gone, but when she comes back and spends some time alone in the apartment herself, um, she gets no peace from this constant noise, the constant knocking. Uh, so I wrote there on the bottom of our list here that we seem to be having poltergeist activity. Um, and poltergeist is a German word for noisy ghost. All right, I just wanted to mention a quick side note about the word poltergeist. Even though it literally means noisy ghost, it's not really a ghost. Um, according to people like Colin Wilson, who wrote this book all about poltergeist activity, um, people who study the paranormal and this kind of activity um, say that these are not actually ghosts or spirits of people who have been left behind. Um, a poltergeist is actually a physical energy that when someone, let's say you're really stressed in life, you're going through an emotional trauma, maybe you've lost a loved one, or you're just under an extraordinary amount of stress and anxiety to the point where you feel like you're just going to break. 
the belief is that people who are experiencing that kind of extreme emotion turn that emotion into physical energy. And so a picture might fall off the wall, or a chair might get knocked over, or a glass might shatter. And of course, to everyone in the room, it looks like ghostly activity. Uh, but that's really a poltergeist activity. It's just nervous energy that's become physical. And the person who's experiencing the stress and who's causing the behavior, they don't even know they're doing it. So keep that in mind as we continue through the story and uh, hear more about the haunting, according to Amanda, because remember, she's the one who's telling us the story um, and giving us all the details. Speaking of ghosts and Amanda, she does manage to make one friend in the neighborhood, and it's that stray German Shepherd dog. Um, this is a really important little detail to kind of stick a pin in and remember this later on. Uh, remember, any time a character is introduced to a story, um, it's not a mistake by the author, it's by design. So there's a reason that Amanda's closest friend, at least the only one we can see at this point, uh, is a dog. And if you hadn't really picked up on why that could be, maybe your wheels are turning now since we're talking about ghosts. But of course, there's a widely held belief for the last you know, several thousand years, there's a folktale belief that animals can sense ghosts and spirits that we can't see or hear. Um, as human beings, you know, we grow up accepting some ideas, rejecting other ideas. We're told that something is real or not real, and we change our beliefs over time. You can't do that to a dog. You can't go to a dog and be like, no, you didn't, you didn't see that, you crazy dog. So it's really important that we have a dog here who could maybe validate the things that Amanda is trying to convince us of. All right, moving on to our major characters. The entire book is told through Amanda's point of view, and we're going to get to know her fairly well. Um, so before we get too into Amanda, let's take a look at another major character, Edward. And I want to see why he's so important, what kind of guy is he, and what kind of impact he made on Amanda's life. So early on, anyway, their marriage seems solid. And Amanda praises the stability and order that Ed brought into her life because he's such a creature of habit, but she also appreciates the class and sophistic sophistication that he introduced her to, right? He took her to cultural events like antique markets and museums, uh, but she also appreciated how handy and practical he is. Um, he can reach the high shelves, and he can actually organize papers into files and put them into a filing cabinet. And she really likes how practical and functional he is. He's just a really stable, normal, down-to-earth kind of guy. And it's really important to know these facts about Ed and why she thinks of him as such a stable and practical person because we can compare this to what Amanda's life was like before she knew Ed. Before she knew him, she sort of lived the life of a perpetual, constant college student, right? Um, she would eat cereal and ice cream all day. She'd lay around watching TV, movies um, the entire day. She'd kind of waste her time. Um, at night, she would get drunk and wake up the next day really severely hungover. Didn't seem to have many friends or, or go out or do very much. So her life just kind of seemed like a really lonely mess until Ed came along and kind of showed her a different way to be, that there's life outside of her four walls that she kind of trapped herself inside of, turn off the TV, put away the junk food, and come out into the world with me and see, see what it's like out here. Now, as wonderful as Ed sounds, and as much as he did change Amanda's life for the positive, he does have some annoying qualities, so I added those down at the bottom. We learn that he is severely allergic to furry little animals like dogs and cats and hamsters. Uh, he also can't eat things like strawberries or mushrooms, and he can't be near soft, really luxurious fabrics like uh, Angora. If you've ever seen an Angora sweater, they're really soft and comfortable and extremely expensive. And at first this might not seem like much, but how would that impact Amanda? Um, obviously now she can't have the pets that she might like to have, she can't enjoy foods that maybe she likes, and she can't treat herself to fancier clothing that contains really nice, fancy fabric and materials. And because Ed just seems so fragile with his allergies, this puts restrictions on Amanda's life. Um, that idea could be really important to us later on. So remember this idea that uh, Amanda might not be able to have all the material things that she wants in order to be happy. She has to give those up because of Ed's pickiness and because of um, his the allergies that he claims he has really bad ones. 
At this point in the story, Amanda begins to dream of this figure, this beautiful female figure um, that is sitting in an ocean of blood when they meet. And according to Amanda's dream, at least how she describes the dream, uh, this figure has big, beautiful, dark eyes, long, dark hair, and a row of sharp teeth in her mouth, sort of like, uh, like pointy shark teeth. And this creature introduces herself as Nama. That's the demon's name, is Nama. And she asks Amanda, can I be with you? Can I just be with you forever? And Amanda accepts, and the two ladies embrace. And at that point on, Amanda has essentially let the demon into her life. As you can see, I listed uh, Nama and some of her traits in the color red, um, because the color red becomes a very important uh, symbol in the story. In literature, the color red is usually connected to sexuality, and of course in nature, uh, red is connected mostly to danger. And sexuality and danger are both going to be really key themes that run through the rest of the story, so I thought I'd kind of mention it now and plant that seed in the back of your head, because you can look for those clues as you read along. Already in the dream, we've seen Nama sitting in an ocean of red. Uh, we know that the sand in the dream has been uh, tinted with a red color. And at one point when Amanda gets sort of shy around Nama, she blushes, so her face even turns red. Um, now Amanda believes this creature, which had seemed somehow familiar to her in some weird way, is Pansy, an imaginary friend that she'd made up back when she was a little girl. This is important because why do you suppose Amanda would love an imaginary friend like Pansy so much? Well, Pansy, the imaginary friend, is described as this wise and soothing character, which must have been very comforting to such a lonely little kid like Amanda was. Amanda would have found comfort with Pansy also, and of course most importantly, because Amanda was surrounded by death. Uh, when she was only three years old, her mother died, and her father quickly remarried another woman who didn't seem to really want children and definitely did not want the responsibility of being a parent, um, which would definitely make a little girl like Amanda feel very, very alone. And so Pansy comes along and is warm and comforting and embraces this little girl, at least in her own head. So it makes sense that Amanda would make up an imaginary friend and sort of project those maternal, motherly sort of personality traits onto this imaginary friend so she would feel at least someone in the world is taking care of her. Unfortunately, Amanda's sense of loss doesn't end there. Uh, when she grows up, her father and her stepmother are both killed in a scuba diving accident which that's, that's such a terrible way to, to die. But this is a horror story, so of course any character who dies in this book is not going to die just peacefully in their sleep. Like, that can't, that can't happen here. And so in one last effort to find some peace and comfort, Amanda ends up telling Ed about this dream. She says, look, I had a dream about this imaginary friend of mine that I haven't thought about in, in decades and years and years and years. And instead of just being open-minded and listening to her and maybe trying to dig down into what her concerns might be, Ed is really dismissive of her and is like, just forget it, don't, don't be silly, you're a grown-up now, stop acting like a baby. Ed's response to her is really, really hurtful, and by the end of chapter 5, we can start to see really subtle changes in her. She begins to start smoking, um, which of course Ed would hate that because of his allergies, and Amanda comes to believe that Nama is the one responsible for the sudden changes in her own personality. Um, in fact, she tells us um, she, meaning Nama, was subtle at first. Um, and so she's saying, you know, the demon did little tricks, little things here and there just to get under my skin and start to change my personality. If you might be reading this from a paranormal perspective, if you believe in ghosts, hell, even if you believe in Amanda in her story, then that's all the proof you need. However, because we're reading this through a psychoanalytic pair of glasses, I want, to sh I want us to kind of push back against the supernatural explanation. And as convincing as Amanda might be, and as much as you want to believe her, keep asking yourself, this probably isn't true, there's no ghost, so why is she making this up? Why? What is she after? What's the currency here? You know, what is she getting out of this? In fact, on page 23 of the book, uh, we can start to see Amanda 
is even thinking about the way she thinks. She's starting to evaluate and sort of analyze her own behaviors. Uh, and she gives this example of the bottle of whiskey. This first voice pops up and says, you know, I'd, I'd like a little sip of that whiskey. A second voice pops up and says, no, you shouldn't. It's fattening and you have to drive. And then a third voice pops up <laughs> along with the other two saying, you know what, don't even think about it. Don't stop. Just do it and have fun. Now, a casual reader might not think anything of this, but because we have already sort of sampled psychoanalysis, um, we understand what's happening. We understand what each of these little voices represent. Right? What's really going on here is the three levels of consciousness. We see them kind of duking it out here, right? They're, they're in a big fight with each other. That first voice, I'd like a little sip, that's the ego, remember? And the ego is trying to sort of wrestle between the higher moral voice and the lower sort of instinctual voice. And so the superego comes along and says, no, think about the consequences. And meanwhile, <laughs> down below in red, the color of danger, um, I wrote what the id is saying, that little impulsive part that's telling her, just do it, come on, don't even think about it. Um, so again, because of our exposure to our psychoanalytic literary theory, you probably spotted that, whereas just a kind of an everyday normal reader probably wouldn't see the layers of psychology happening here with this one example. Already, at this point in the story, we're starting to see cracks in the marriage of Amanda and Ed. Now, clearly, they, they love each other, um, but whenever you put two people under the same roof, um, they begin to reveal a lot about themselves to each other. Right? What we've established so far about Amanda is that she is an architect. We know that she has been abandoned by a lot of the uh, grown-ups in her life. Uh, we also know that she was very lonely as a child, and it doesn't seem like it changed very much as an adult. And in fact, she sort of is dependent on Ed. He had to sort of rescue her from her mess of a life, um, and it seems like she's, she's pretty dependent on him throughout their, throughout their marriage. Uh, but now we're starting to see some changes in Amanda, and all of those little traits that she liked about Ed are now starting to get on her nerves. She calls him compulsively neat. Compulsively is really not a nice thing to, to say about somebody. Um, it's one thing to be neat and tidy, but if you are compulsively neat, that means you are rigid and inflexible and you just don't let things go. In fact, we know that Ed is such a creature of habit. He likes things to be in a certain particular way every time, all the time, that when things go wrong, if something is ever different, it just throws this guy off. He just totally derails, and he can't stand it anymore, and he throws a tantrum like a baby. And in fact, that sense of being predictable, which Amanda liked when they first got married, um, she's bored with him now. In fact, one of the worst things she says about him is that there are no surprises from this guy. Um, and I don't think there's anything worse from a partner than being called boring. In a way, she begins to sort of lash out against him by picking up smoking, which she knows is going to bother someone as picky and fussy as Ed. And in fact, in his efforts to try and stop her, he's downright cruel to her. First he says, you know, it's bothering my allergies, which just bothers Amanda. It just, it just bugs her that he keeps going back to that. Um, and then he says, you know, your, your hair smells and your teeth are turning yellow. And at one point he calls her ugly. Um, so he uses this sort of verbal abuse, this emotional abuse, in order to exert some cr control over Amanda and change her behaviors, or in his case, correct her behaviors. Her smoking habit has gotten so bad that she tells us when she sees a lit cigarette, she feels like a starving person looking at a steak, right? Um, and that sounds like her id, that impulsive, instinctual part of her, is getting stronger. It wants what it wants, and it wants it right now. And she seems to be listening to that little voice, the red voice, if you want to come, think of it that way. And oddly enough, down here on the bottom of my list, I wrote that she feels younger and freer. And I put a little star next to that, too. That's going to be really important to remember, that Amanda is feeling like a completely different, better person. Now that she's sort of lashing out and sort of kind of developing her own interest in a way. 
this is important because throughout the story, isn't she trying to sort of form her own unique identity, sort of separate from Ed? And what usually prevents any of us from being our own authentic self? Other people, right? Other people kind of get in our way of just us wanting to be the person we want to be. And that same thing is happening to Amanda, it looks like. In Chapter 6, Amanda receives a book called Demon Possession, Past and Present. Um, I have something sort of similar. It's called the Encyclopedia of Demons. Um, be because why not? I got it for Christmas one year because it's, it's the perfect Christmas gift. But Amanda claims that she didn't order it. She says she has no idea where that came from. We could believe her, but we know that she's already established a pattern of doing things or saying things that later on she doesn't seem to remember. Perhaps something deep down inside of her is trying to send her clues to help her save herself. I mean, there's, there's one reading. Maybe she's doing things to help herself and doesn't remember them later on. Uh, at any rate, in this book, she decides to take a quiz and she marks off the things that seem to be happening to her. And her complete list looks something like this. So according to the little quiz she takes in her book, um, she has marked these items off. Number one, strange noises. Number two, out of character behavior. Number three, short tempered, means she's easily angered. Number six, unusual thoughts or voices. And number seven, she is having dreams of the entity. And according to the results of the quiz, she's in the stage of haunting or early possession. And it's in this stage, according to the book, that the demon is obsessed with the victim and is trying to exert its control. And according to Amanda in her dream, the demon tells her, I choose you and nothing can get me out. Uh, another great little detail I love at this point in the story is that the characters no longer hear the knocking on the doors or the walls. Um, and we can assume that's because Amanda has now officially let the demon in. It no longer needs to knock on the door. And now that Nama seems to be running the show here, we can see some cha changes here, back over my shoulder, uh, in Amanda. The most important one, the most obvious one, is she becomes an unlikely thief. And she accidentally walks out of a drugstore with this dark red lipstick. Again, that color red is popping up here. Now, she doesn't remember doing it. But when she runs out of this particular color, the next time she goes back to the drugstore, she intentionally steals the next lipstick. So she knew what she was doing there. That was a conscious act. And so her id, that impulsive voice that, voice that says, give this to me now, is getting much stronger with her. We also see her steal a red doorknob, that ruby doorknob, um, which sounds like a really pretty antique. She steals that from a client's house. She has also begun drinking pretty heavily, and she starts having sexual affairs with the sort of bad boys that she used to go out with back before she knew stable, boring Ed. And when she feels like in a sexy mood, she starts dressing more sexy, and one of her favorite things to wear is this soft, shiny, red, silky kimono. So again, that color red. She is also becoming more violent, and at one point she decides to put her cigarette out on Ed's leg. She just takes it out, reaches over, and stabs him right in the knee with it for what seems like no reason. She seems kind of surprised by it, but really she was sort of watching it in slow motion and kind of watching it play out in her mind. Um, so this could be some of that displacement where all this anger and resentment she feels about Ed and how boring he is and how boring he's made her life, maybe it's starting to show itself. And so she took that anger and just <laughs> put her cigarette out right on his leg. And even at this point, she is going through a physical transformation. Her eyes look really well rested, her skin looks really radiant and it's kind of glowing. And she's even put on a few extra healthy pounds. The extra weight looks really good on her. She just looks very radiant and very happy. There's sort of a glow about her. Now, is that demonic? Is that because there's a demon inside of her? Or perhaps is she starting to feel sort of that the happiness of independence that maybe she hasn't felt for a very long time. It's also not just Ed, though, who has noticed these differences in Amanda. Her friend, that little German Shepherd dog, 
um, is sort of barking at her, trying to take bites at her. So the dog seems to notice that there's something different about her and is afraid to approach, doesn't want to be near her. And when he is near Amanda, this dog is sensing danger. So think of everything that you have learned and established about Amanda and her life and her marriage. The story seems to be setting up the idea that this demon has come along and found a happy home inside of Amanda's body and is causing her um, to do the strange things that are out of character for her, like the smoking and the sexual affairs and the dangerous new habits like, like drinking to the point of drunkenness. The story is saying that these are all caused by the presence of an evil entity within her. However, what if it's not a ghost? What if we are listening to the facts of Amanda's story as a psychologist would? Then what is really happening here if we look at her behaviors, if we look at the choices that she has made so far? Is she mentally ill? Saying that she's just crazy, that she's mentally ill, seems like too easy of a label to slap on her. Could she be simply dissatisfied with a life and a marriage that has gotten tedious and predictable and boring and she's looking for an escape. Maybe she's looking for a way out. And so if that kind of seems to be the direction we're moving in, if it seems like Amanda simply wants independence and wants to get out of the marriage, why would she create a demon to do that? Uh, I'm gonna leave the conversation here for now. Um, we'll touch again on this in one of our next videos. But for now, I want you to kind of think of that question as you're reading. Uh, why create this whole story if what she's after is escape? What does the demon do for her if that's what's really going on? Um, so think about that as you read along, and we will take a look at that question again the next time I see you. So in the meantime, stay healthy, stay safe, and hopefully I'll see you soon. All right, bye, 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 bye.